My brothers and sisters, welcome back to another Disciple Talk Bible Study, the teaching ministry of the First Congregational Church. And we are just so thankful again to gather and to uh, be able to bring the Word of God again as we continue our study through the first letter to the Thessalonians that the Apostle Paul wrote. Uh, we are beginning part five as we enter chapter five on this particular study. And before we do that, we do go to the text rather, we do want to do a little review because there's some important matters we just want to speak about before we finish up chapter five because there's so much rich truths that's in this letter, especially when we're dealing with prophecy and eschatology that is it's just, it's just so much information. But we want to try to give it to you in bite-sized pieces so that your understanding of what the church is dealing with today, what the church at Thessalonica was dealing with, is more accurately interpreted and understood historically and in the present hour the church is passing through. So let, let's open with a word of prayer. We just want to welcome the Congregational Church and all those who are listening through social media to the Disciple Talk Bible Teaching Ministry of the Congregational Church. Welcome Let's pray. Father, we ask your blessing now as we go into the word of God, that you would teach us your ways, uh, lead us in your truth, and show us your paths, so that we'll be following Jesus in these last and evil days, living for his glory, worshiping him in spirit and truth, serving uh, 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 for the cause of the kingdom in this fallen world, and Lord, most importantly, proclaiming the glorious gospel of your son and his kingdom to those who have not yet believed so that they will know the truth and the truth can set them free. Save souls is our sincerest prayer and strengthen your church to walk with Christ in these last days in Jesus name. Amen and a Man. Well, I want to do a little review because there were some things we talked about in chapter four that need a little bit more amplification and possible clarification. As we introduced last week, the rapture of the church, this, this event, this imminent event that is soon to come, we don't know when it's imminent, meaning it could happen 10 years ago, it could happen tomorrow, it could happen at any moment. Thus, we learned from last week that the church's primary role in light of the rapture is to be faithful, is to be faithful. And one of the first things I want to clear up from last week is the rapture of Christians who had already died. Now, the concern in, in Thessalonica in chapter four was what's going to happen to my brothers or sisters in Christ who already had died. And that was the concern in chapter four. And the apostle Paul is saying to the church at Thessalonica, even if a Christian has already physically died, when the Lord returns in the air to rapture his church, the dead will come with him, meaning their physical bodies, will, their bodies will be raised and changed to meet the Lord in the air. Because you gotta remember, when a Christian dies physically, their spirit Go, and so goes to be with the Lord. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So at the rapture of the church, what we're talking about is the a resurrection of the body that will be changed into an immortal body and, and reunite it so that the person will have a, a, a spiritual body to spend eternity with the Lord. This, this has to be understood because when Jesus died, he, physically, his body was laid in a tomb, but his spirit and soul, he commended back to the Father. It was his physical body that was raised and changed to a glorified body. So it is with us Christians in the rapture or the resurrection. And again, remember at physical death for a Christian, their soul and body separate. The body is placed back in the ground to await the bodily resurrection. The soul goes to be with the Lord. At the rapture, the body is supernaturally raised and changed just like Jesus' was on the third day to ever be reunited and to be in the presence of the Lord with a spiritually glorified body. 
Now this is important and to really get the in-depth teaching on this, you need to go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the most co uh, uh, complete treatment of teaching on the resurrection of the body as it talks about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So I wanted to go back over that point. The second thing I wanted to kind of uh, bring to light is that when we talk about the rapture, there are many different views about when the rapture will take place. There are people who believe that the rapture will take place, take place before the tribulation, before uh, the Antichrist is revealed and the seven year tribulation. There are those who believe that the rapture of the church will take place in the middle of the tribulation in the th seven years, right in the middle of those seven years that the church will be raptured. So in that view, the church will, will actually experience some of the tribulation. And then there's those who believe that the, 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 the church will not be raptured until at the end of the tribulation, uh, the seven year period as we understand the tribulation. And thus, these different views of when the rapture will take place are, are widespread among Christians throughout the world and in our eschatology. And obviously, I've been coming from a pre-tribulation rapture perspective in which I am leaning on the fact that we will be raptured before the tribulation. Now, get this, and I hope you hear me well. The most important thing is you're going to be raptured. That's a clear, that's a that's a fact. Whether it's pr before the tribulation, in the middle of the tribulation, or after the tribulation, the most important thing that we all can say and do is be faithful. Be faithful no matter when it is, but we know it's going to happen. And and thus you're running to people who have different views of when the rapture will take place. But that's not an issue for us to divide off over as Christians. It's just a part of the interpretation of these prophetic verses uh, in, in the Old Testament, the New Testament, the book of Revelation. And there have been these different views throughout church history. So I just wanted to say that. The third thing I want to say is this, this uh, word, the day of the Lord, the day of the Lord. You can find this in the Old Testament, the New Testament, and the book of Revelation. The day of the Lord is simply a period of time when the Lord is directly, personally intervening in the affairs of men for judgment. It, it's a day in which the Lord will judge the earth. And much of that day of the Lord, many believe, begins at the rapture and carries itself forward until actually the Lord comes back physically on the earth with his church. So uh, I can't go through all of that in the teaching right now, but it's an area of study and, and, and I would encourage you to, to read up on it. There's some great commentaries. Uh, Ray Stedman has one called God's Final Word, which I think is very readable and, and one that my, the Holy Spirit has led me to really uh, resonate with uh, to, uh, I've been using the out teaching outline of John Stott. So, uh, and, and then there's possible Bible studies you can do personally. But the key is to this. One, Jesus is going to rapture his church. We don't know if it's pre-trib, post-trib, mid-trib. It's going to happen, but there are various views. We know that the rapture is when the, the, the bodies of Christians, dead or alive, will be raised and changed in physical bodies to a glorified body, a spiritual body, to ever live in spiritual eternity with the Lord. And that the day of the Lord is a period of time when God will, through his son, directly judge this world and bring about an end to it as we know it and create a new heaven and a new earth. So I wanted to say those things up front. And uh, if you have any questions, if you got anything, please, I've been begging for emails, phone calls. I hope you are, are, are engaging these teachings with your thinking. And if you have questions, just email me at pastormrs at att.net or call me through our information on our website at fccraleigh.org. 
Well, I, I want to go further today in, in chapter 5. And uh, you should have read chapter 5 if you're a congregational disciple. And if you're just coming and watching this for the first time or been following us, uh, we invite you to follow along with us as we now deal with the fifth chapter of, of 1 Thessalonians. Now, the, the main teaching of this fifth chapter is this. This, this chapter reveals some things for us to just be aware of. First, the fifth chapter reveals Christians have an understanding of the day of the Lord because we are children of the light and not children of the darkness. That simply means we can see what's going on. We have an understanding of what's going on because we are children of God. We have the word of God. We have the Holy Spirit. And because we are children of God, we are children of the light. Light brings illumination, doesn't it? Light lets you see what's around you and what's going on so you'll be able to live accordingly. So one thing the fifth chapter brings out is that we're children of light and we're not children of the darkness. Now, the children of the darkness refers to those who are unbelievers, those who are just spiritually dead in their sins. Uh, like we used to be before we were born again. And thus, on a spiritual note, a spirit understanding spirituality, they don't have a clue what's going on. It's like walking in spiritual darkness. They have don't understand anything about what we're talking about, the rapture, the church, the coming of Christ, uh, what's going on spiritually in this world, spiritual warfare, all these things that we should be alert to as Christians. We're in the light, they are in the dark. That's what first, this fifth chapter will show. And it also says Christians will not experience the wrath of God, meaning we will not experience God's outpouring of his wrath on this earth. That's what we've been saved from. As it says in uh, 1 Thessalonians uh, 1.10, I believe it is, 1 Thessalonians uh, 1.10 puts it this way, uh, that he has not saved us. I'm sorry, First Thessalonians 10, for you are witnesses and God also how divinely and justly he, we behaved ourselves among you. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation. And it says in First Thessalonians uh, 1 Thessalonians 1.10 specifically, and to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. That's in 1 Thessalonians 1.10. Talking about how we're to live blamelessly and, and how we are to be comforted that he who calls us to his kingdom asks us to walk worthy of his kingdom. And verse 10, 1 Thessalonians 1.10, and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. So God's wrath is coming. And there's two words for God's wrath. One is the Greek word thumos. The other is the Greek word orge. Orge more talks about God's settled decision on something. Thumos is more of the boiling, agitated kind of, of anger that we can see in humanity. But nonetheless, God has a wrath, that God is angry with sin. God has a set opposition to sinful behavior. And his wrath is a decision that will bring judgment on sin. So let, let's keep that general understanding when we talk about the wrath of God. God's wrath is his, uh, is his decision against sin that is a just decision in which he will punish sin. He will mete out proper justice against sin and thus the wrath of God, the, 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 the orge of God or the thumos of God will be demonstrated and we are spared from that because we are in Christ. And lastly, the first chapter five teaches Christians are a community of people who are hardworking, law-abiding, loving, patient, full of good works and seeking to bear witness to the gospel of Jesus Christ. So let's go into chapter five. Now, there's a lot of intro and review, I know, but that's what we're here to do, teach the Bible. We're not here 
to, to go through no dog and pony show, hooping and hollering. Uh, we want you to understand the word of God, and that takes time to explain it if we're going to teach the word of God. Amen. Well, let's look at chapter 5, verse 1. But concerning the times and seasons, brothers and sisters, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. And when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman and they shall not escape. Then verse four says, but you brothers and sisters are not in the darkness so that this day should overtake you as a thief. You are all sons or children of light and children of the day. We are not of the night nor of the darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others, but let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who are drunk are drunk at night. But let us put on the day, but be we are of the day, be sober, putting on the breastplate of righteousness, of breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Therefore, comfort each other and edify each other just as you are doing. These first 11 verses uh, continue to build on what we talked about in chapter 4, uh, the concern about Christians who had died and the Apostle Paul explaining to Thessalonians that those who have died will be raised. They'll, they will be resurrected at Christ's return, the rapture. They will be changed. Their bodies will be raised from the dead. They will be raised first. And if you are alive when Christ comes back, your body will be supernaturally uh, changed into a glorified body and raised. So he continues to, to build on that issue by comforting the Thessalonians with this truth. And as we pick up in verse one of chapter five, he said, and concerning the times and the season, we don't have any need to write to you. For it says in verse two, you yourselves perfectly know that the day of Lord comes as a thief. Nobody knows when it's going to exactly be. That's what it means. If you knew when a thief was coming, you would know when he's coming. A thief wants to come when nobody thinks he's coming. So the day that the coming of the Lord, the day of the Lord, as it says in verse two, comes as a thief in the night. Now, now we do know that the Bible speaks of signs. When you re read Matthew 24, uh, many interpret the 24th chapter of Matthew as the prophetic signs for Israel, but some interpret that as the signs the church should be looking for during the church age. I think there's some truth on both sides, but we do know this, that we're living in the last days. Because Hebrews tells us when the last days began. And in Hebrews 1, 1, it says, God, who at various times and various ways spoke in the past to the fathers by the prophets. Then verse 2, has in these last days spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things through whom he made the world. Therefore, He's, Hebrews teaches that the last days are signified or signal through the coming of the Savior. You know, we're celebrating Christmas. Uh, the birth of Christ was the beginning of the last days, biblically supported. He has spoken to us in these last days by his son. Jesus Christ was born. That's what we're celebrating at Christmas. All this other stuff that Everybody putting their mind on it got nothing to do with, with the birth of Christ. It has nothing to do with Christmas. This is what the devil wants to keep you from understanding if you are uh, uh, an, an unbeliever in the dark, as you will. He wants you to put your mind on, on Santa Claus, reindeers, elves, the Grinch, all this kind of stuff. So you won't recognize that the birth of Christ signified the beginning of the last days. 
That's what Christmas tells us. God sent his son to, to be the savior of the world. And Christ has come, died, and rose, thus the last days. And that's what Thessalonians 5, 1 and 2 is talking about. Has In the day of the Lord comes as a thief in the night. So we know these are the last days, but we don't know exactly when the Lord's going to come back. That's why we say the rapture says that we don't know exactly when it's going to happen. It's going to be imminent. It can happen at any time. So the, the, the again, the main lesson is be faithful. Be ready. And look at verse three. For when they say peace and safety, when those who walking around don't know what's happening, talking about everything's hunky-dory, then sudden destruction comes upon them as a labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape, meaning it is too late for them. It's too late. See, there comes a time, my brothers and sisters, when it's too late. And, and, and being too late is, is a sad reality. You know, um, that's why this gospel of being preached is so important, so people have opportunity to believe the gospel and be saved. Thus, verse 4 says, But you, brothers and sisters, are not in the darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. So who will this day be a thief to? It'll be a thief to those who don't know the Lord. Be like a thief coming to those who don't know the Lord. Right now, we know it's the last days. We know Christ is coming. We've been warned to be ready. Is that right? So the issue for us is just waiting until he comes. We know he's coming. We may not know the, the exact moment in time, but we know he's coming. We're not like people who are in the darkness, as it says uh, in verse 4, that, that they should overtake us as a thief in the night. So that's the distinction. The church should be uh, expecting. The church should be looking forward to, though we don't know the exact time, date, or hour. And that's why we reject people who set certain dates and that times of the year when the Lord is coming back. We know he's coming back. We're looking for him. We're not like people who don't believe. They're not looking for him. They don't have a clue what's going on. And it'll be like a thief in the night to them. And verse four says, therefore, let us not sleep. Let us not be uh, morally lethargic. Let us not be as if we are unaware these are the last days. Uh, I kind of like to think of it about uh, and illustrated by the way my mom and dad used to teach us growing up on Davies Street uh, when they would leave the house uh, and they tell you to make up your bed and by the time they got back. Uh, you had to do something to prepare for their return and that, that thing was to make up your bed. Thus, we, we, we didn't wait till the last moment. To, I didn't. <laughs> I didn't wait till the last minute to make up my bed. I made up my bed just as soon as I could because I wanted to be ready when they came back. I didn't want to be scrambling. I, don't, I didn't want to be uh, panicking when I heard the, the, the car pull up and them closing their doors coming into the house. And that's what it means by uh, don't sleep. Don't be lethargic. Don't be lazy. Don't be procrastinating as Christians as others do, but let us watch and be sober, verse 6 says. And, and this is a, something for us. Make sure your bed is already made up. Make sure you've made it up and, and it's all in place so that you can concentrate on the return of the Lord instead of uh a, a panicking and being in the desperation mode. That's not what the Lord wants. He wants us to not sleep, be lethargic, to be uh, procrastinating, but to watch and be sober. That word sober means serious. You know, when we normally say somebody is sober, we say they're not drunk. Uh, they're not intoxicated with some uh, beverage or some alcohol. And, and that's the word that simply means be serious. Have your faculties clear. Have a clear mind. And, and don't let things clutter up your mind as we are expecting the return of the Lord. And thus, don't be like other people, so preoccupied with everything else, large, living in sexual immorality, as we talked at length about last week, living according to the world instead of the kingdom, 
those who don't know Christ, you expect them to be like that. But for us who are Christian, this is who the warning is coming, warning is coming to. Don't, don't you as a Christian be like that. Be, be, don't be sleep. Don't be, uh, have your bed unmade. Be prepared. Be expecting. Be looking. Be serious. Be sober. Be on watch. And this is so critical today in this time in which we are living when so many things distract us from the truth of Christ's return that take us away. So many priorities that now take the place of being sober and watchful for the return of Christ. But this is a reality in the New Testament. Everywhere you see it says they're waiting for the Lord. They're waiting for the Lord. This is our great expectation and hope. It's in his return. It cannot be overemphasized or spoken enough about or prioritized enough. What, as I mentioned in the sermon recently, if Jesus is not coming back, what, what is the point? If, if that's not your hope as a child of God, what, what's the point of singing, worshiping, serving, uh, if he's not coming back to receive us? And we remember that he said, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place, I'm coming back. This is what Paul is telling the church at Thessalonica. Through the rapture and the return of Christ uh, to the earth with his saints, with the church who has been raised and brought with him in the rapture. Verse 7 says, for those who sleep, sleep at night and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. You know what's going on out there in that darkness? You know, just use the illustration what's going on out there in that physical darkness every night here in Raleigh. Folk getting shot, folk getting killed, folk getting robbed, uh, folk getting killed in an accident. All kind of foolishness happens in the dark because people just stumbling around. This is what Revelation, I mean, Proverbs teaches that people don't even know what, what they're stumbling over. Out there dying uh, for nothing. Out there uh, lives being uh, all twisted because of relationships and and in, in, uh, uh, things they're getting involved in that ain't, uh, that's not about anything. Think about what's going on out there in the darkness of our communities right now. That's what he's talking about. Those who sleep, sleep at night. Those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But let us, here it is for the church, let us who are of the day be sober. That is serious. Putting on what? The breastplate of faith. Make sure you're walking by faith and love. Make sure you're walking in love toward God and your neighbor and having the helmet of salvation. The helmet is protecting your mind, protecting your thoughts, protecting you from things that will keep you from thinking right, thinking biblically, thinking as a Christian. Thus, he says, how do we stay sober? Put on the breastplate of faith. For without faith, it's impossible to please God. And the, and the love, uh, love is the badge of Christian discipleship and the help of salve, helmet of the hope of salvation. I'm going to be saved. He's coming back for me, whether I die physically or I'm alive. I'm going to be with the Lord. But look at verse 9. For the Lord did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation. There it is again. We saw it in 1 Thessalonians 1 9. We see it again. God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we are awake, living, or sleep, physically dead, we should live together with him. Nothing can stop us from being reunited with him. We will not experience the wrath of God. Now, my brother and sisters got to say something a little more about this wrath. I talked about it some weeks ago. But God's wrath will come against all sin. The difference between the church and those who are not Christians is he has forgiven us from the penalty of our sins, which would have been his wrath judging us and eventually separating us for eternity from the presence of the Lord in the lake of fire. You and I, because we have believed on Christ and have been born again, will not suffer that judgment. Hallelujah. We will not experience that wrath of God, but the world will and all those who don't know Christ. This is the reality that is dumbed down today. 
This is the reality that, and even in some churches, you don't even hear the truth anymore about the judgment of God because they have abandoned the word of God. And thus, people are walking and living in sin, living any kind of way they want to, and under the ban of Christianity. And there'll be the crowd that's spoken of in Matthew chapter 7 at the end when they stand before God and he said, I never knew you. And why did he know you? He said, because you kept practicing sin. You kept living in iniquity. You, now, we know that our works don't save us, but if you are unintentionally, unrepentantly able to live a simple life and say you're a Christian, let me tell you something. You're a liar. You're deceived. And you better read Matthew 7 before it's too late because true Christians, true Christians have a, a, an opposing nature towards sin. We still sin. But we don't live in it unrepentantly. We don't live in sin and can enjoy it. We can't do that anymore because we have a new nature. And thus, this is what he's saying. He didn't appoint us to wrath. Wrath is appointed to those who don't know the Lord. Christians must be our persons who, who seek and must seek to live right. Because we've been spared. We're thankful. We're, we're appreciative of the grace of God. Thus, we, we have a different disposition towards sin. And thus, to know that we're not going to be judged is something we praise God for that deliverance. For it says, for he, verse 10, who died for us, whether we wake or sleep, we should live together. Therefore, what? Comfort each other, comfort each other, and edify each other as you're doing. See, knowing what we have as a hope in our Christian life should should comfort us and edify us or build us up. And that's why a Christian is a victor, an overcomer, a person who is learning to walk in the spirit and anticipate the return of Christ. And our lives illustrate a different direction, a different purpose, a different mission, a different focus because of what Christ Jesus has done for us in our salvation. And we comfort each other, even when physical death comes through these realities and through these things of having a living hope uh, in all these things of tribulations down here. We can find, even in the worst times down here, a hope and a faith and a desire to keep on living faithfully for Jesus Christ. And then he speaks about very quickly in verses 12 and 13, the work of leadership. He says, and we urge you, brothers, to recognize those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord, meaning the pastors and leaders of the church that God has placed over you. Recognize not them, but their works for their works sake, uh, who labor. There it is. Recognize those who labor. Just because a person in leadership don't mean that they're serving God. Uh, but those who are uh, serving the Lord for your edification, you are to uh, respect uh, for, the, for, the, for what God has placed them to do and the work they do. Uh, there's too much celebrityism today in the church where some leaders uh, uh, want people to worship them. This, this is not Christianity. This is man on parade. This is the flesh on parade. And as I've said before, true leaders will always lead you to worship the Lord and to follow Jesus, not them, as they follow Christ. But guess what? Even in our best days as leaders, we're still not the one worthy to follow. You know, you should be always following the one who's always worthy, and his name is Jesus Christ. He is never failure. He has no sin, has no failure, has no issues. He's the one you're following. And those of us in leadership should just be the best examples with flaws that we can be. But nonetheless, the one you're following is Jesus Christ. But, but, but to respect people who he has placed in the church, according to Ephesians uh, 4 and 11. Esteem them highly for their work's sake, it says. And then it closes these verses out by exhorting what Christian fellowship, Christian worship, and the glorification as it says in verses 14 and 15, you see what a fellowship should be like. We exhort you, warn those who are unruly. You should 
Comfort the faint-hearted. Uphold the weak. Be patient with all. Don't render evil for evil. Always pursue what is good both for yourselves and for everybody else. Have a rejoicing heart and spirit. Pray without ceasing. Be thankful no matter what your circumstances are, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus. It talks about don't despise prophecy or the spirit of God. Don't despise hearing the spirit. Sometimes the spirit will, will deal with you in a way that you don't like it, but don't despise it. Let him have his way in your life. Uh, don't despise prophecies or understanding what God is saying to you personally for your present and your future. Sometimes people don't want to hear the truth, but you got to hear the truth. Don't despise the truth. Don't despise prophecy. But it does say test all things. Hold fast to what is good. Try things out. Don't take things as face value. Verse 21, uh, verse 22, abstain from every form of evil. Listen, as I said, you got to protect what you allow your mind to watch, your eyes to see, your mind to think on. And, and you must abstain from everything that is evil. You can't play with evil, church. You cannot be allow evil to be have a, a home or a place of comfort in your heart. You must hate evil. Look, abstain from every form, no matter how it comes, no matter where it comes. And with all this media today, it comes in so many different ways. And then the last exhortation, now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be, be preserved blameless at the coming. Here it is, the return of Jesus Christ. See, there it is again. It goes all the way back to him coming back. That your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. See, that's what it's all about. He said he calls us. He justifies us. He will glorify us. He justified us at salvation. He sanctifies us during our walk down here. And he will ultimately glorify us when he returns to rapture his church. And as, 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 as it says in 1 Corinthians 15, in a moment in the twinkling of an eye, we shall be changed and we shall put on immortality. The sufferings of this present time, Roman 8 says, is not worthy to be compared with what is to be revealed, the glory that's be revealed in us. And we see that till the coming of the Lord. All of our uh, glorification, everything will come together to where we'll spend eternity with the Lord in glory as his people, his church, his redeemed. And it says in verse 24, he who calls you is faithful, who also will do it. The one who calls you is the one who's faithful and he's going to bring it to pass. As Philippians says, he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion in Jesus Christ. Well, this, this comes to the conclusion of our study in 1 Thessalonians. We're going to 2 Thessalonians next week. I encourage you to start reading 2 Thessalonians, but I really encourage you to give me your questions if you got any about our study of the first five chapters of 1 Thessalonians. As we go further, we'll continue to see the prophetic truths of God's word as we go into 2 Thessalonians. I pray this has been a blessing to you in some way. I pray that the Holy Spirit has used these stumbling words of mine to help you hear what God has to say. Let us pray. Father, open our eyes to see what you've said to us. And may it sink deep into our hearts. And may we respond in obedience in Jesus' name. God bless you. Well, this is Pastor Smith. And to all who are listening, there's not formal members of Congregational Church. Listen, if you don't have a church home, you need to be in local fellowship if you're a Christian. You just, it's not enough just to be on social media. And if you're looking for a, a, a local church, go to our website, fccriley.org, and call me, and let's talk about what the Lord is doing in your life. And lastly, if you're not a Christian, I, I'm not a Christian I beg you to believe the gospel. Believe that Jesus died on the cross to forgive you for your sins. Believe that he rose from the dead. Believe that he is the son of the living God so that you will be spared 
from eternal separation in the lake of fire. And recognizing that the only way to avert that, to, to get away from that, is to call on his name to save you, according to Romans 10. And he who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. I beg you to believe the gospel. Repent and believe the gospel. Well, we'll see you next week. And we pray that you'll be encouraged and that you'll keep following Jesus Christ. This is Pastor Smith. We'll see you next week on Disciple Talk Bible Study. God bless you.